What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the O Show podcast. It is presented by Mayweather Boxing and Fitness in Scottsdale, Arizona. Mayweather Boxing and Fitness is an inclusive, high-intensity fitness experience developed by the champ Floyd Money Mayweather himself. Head on down to Mayweather Boxing and Fitness in Scottsdale. It's formulated with the perfect combination of boxing strength and cardio conditioning intervals designed to make you look good, feel good, and leave you with more than just a great sweat. We're also now presented by TickPick. I don't know if you've ever used TickPick, Greg. Have you no. ever used TickPick? No, I'm so, interested. Have you ever used StubHub before? Yep. So StubHub, it doesn't matter how big your purchase is. Let's say you're going to the Phoenix Suns game yep. this week. In game five, if there's a game five against New Orleans when they come back to Footprint Center, right? Yep. There might be like a hundred and hundred and twenty-five dollar ticket for a nosebleed seat, and you'll get like a thirty dollar fee on top of that. Yeah. No hidden fees with Tick Pick. Oh, nice. And you know they're not just promoting that as like a selling point. Like you actually yeah. go in there, like a Diamondbacks ticket I bought the other night, five dollars, legitimately five dollar ticket. Wow. I'm I'm gonna I'm definitely checking out Tick Pick. Well, you are uh, you're in town at CB Live this weekend with. Yep. Daryl Hammond. Them. You're opening for Daryl Hammond, right? Yeah, I toured Daryl Hammond. Uh, Daryl Hammond's a 14-year cast member on Saturday Night Live. He's also yes, the cur- current announcer on Saturday Night Live. What and, does that entail? Uh, so he, you know, at the top of the credits when you see the show starts. Yeah. And uh, announce, they announce all the players and the guests and stuff. Uh, he's the announcer. Oh, no way. Yeah. Oh, oh absolutely. Okay. Yeah. That makes more sense. I'm like, okay, yeah, I definitely know who he is then. Because I yeah. remember... Um, give a shout out to Adam Black for setting this up, yeah. uh, talking about you, you and Daryl. I'm just like, huh? Like I do remember the face, but now definitely the so, voice. Yeah. So he's the current voice now. That happened about five years ago. But before that, he was a cast member for 14 seasons. He played uh, Bill Clinton and Sean yep. Connery and Celebrity Rehab. That was probably his most famous. And Bill Clinton. But he did over 100 and something impressions uh, on Saturday Night Live. One of the best impressionists of all time. And, uh, and we became friends, and I toured with him, man. I got lucky. How long have you been touring with him? Uh, a couple years, two, two, three years. So we were supposed to start touring before the pandemic. Okay. And uh, we had a bunch of tour dates set up, and the pandemic hit. And so they all got canceled, and I was like, oh, man, this, what a nightmare. Oh, my God. And, uh, and then, you know, we've just been good friends, and so now we're touring. I also toured with Jay Moore. Okay. Uh, but mostly, you know, mostly with Daryl. So we did... Uh, uh, we're doing this. We're, you know, we're going to Florida, I think, twice. We just did a week in Vegas at the, um, the Laugh Factory at, uh, at the Laugh Factory at uh, Tropicana. Oh, yeah, yeah, We did uh, eight shows and four nights there. It was, it was awesome. So. How is the Laugh Factory? It's great. That's said to be like one of the best spots. Yeah, it's, it's great. You know, it's, what was really great about it is you're in Vegas. And, you know, I've, I've done Vegas before, but this is the first time that my name was in uh, the big lights on the billboards out in front on the strip and it's you know it's daryl hammond yeah and then greg Baldwin underneath it but it was uh it was pretty cool and uh, we did eight shows p- packed every night eight shows in four nights and it was just incredible just what an incredible experience what do you think is the best club you've ever performed at or just like overall environment yeah. i guess so they're all great uh you know the 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 main three uh in los angeles so i live in los angeles the main three are the comedy store yeah the uh hollywood improv and the laugh factory so those are the main three but i've done i've done all i've done two for some reason i've never done the laugh factory in hollywood um but i did i've done the laugh factory in san diego and then in vegas um but i was i did the comedy store the the comedy store is really interesting because it, it was created in the 1970s, and it was like a comedy college. But Richard Pryor, yeah. uh, David Letterman, Jay Leno, um, uh, you name it, all of them. Uh, Robin Williams, it was their home club, and they all developed there. So the opportunity, when I, when I perform there, it's you're walking out on the same stage through the, through the same curtains as, as the all-time it's the greats. Best. It's just the history. It's just amazing. So... And the way it works at the comedy store and a lot of the big clubs is that you, you, uh, you have to get passed to perform there. So at the comedy store, I'm not passed. Uh, it's very difficult to get passed. But they do these other producer-based shows that I, I'm able to perform on. But, uh, you know, you got to be a huge, you know, it's like Bill Burr's there every oh, week. Joe Ro- that was Joe Rogan's home club before he moved to Austin. And, 
you got all the best comedians in the world working out there, and I do these other shows there, um, and I get to perform, perform with a lot of them, which is really cool. So. And those guys just get to show up, too, whenever they yeah. feel, oh, put, put them on the bill, put them on the bill. Or, like, I feel like you'd have to... So they, there's a thing that's called avails. So they call, they call in their avails to the comedy store on Mondays. And so in order to be, uh, call in your avails, you have to be a paid regular. So And that, that means you get your name on the wall and everything. And so they call in their avails. But then there's a, there's a next level up, which is Bill Burr, right. uh, uh, Chris Rock, um, those type of guys. They can just show up, and then they'll get put up. But if they continuously do that, some of the other comedians uh, resent them because they're getting, you know, they're booting other people exactly. off to get their stage time. So if somebody shows up and, and does an hour, uh, then, you know, four people aren't able to go up. Mm. So uh, they're, usually the comedians are very respectful. And then what will happen is they'll let them know. So like the biggest comedians in the world, a lot of times they don't want their names on the uh, lineup to sell tickets. Right. Uh, so they drop in. So that for them at the comedy store and some of those big clubs, all the biggest comedians all over the, from, the, from uh, the country that reside in L.A., they go work out all their new material there. So that's like for me and you, like it would be an open mic that we go work out our yeah. material. They go work out their material at the biggest clubs in L.A. And then what they do is they, perf they work out their material and then they take it on the road. And that's where they make a lot of money. So. Oh yeah, and then they record their specials, and then yeah. next thing you know, like that's their next big set for the next three years. Yeah, it's it's amazing. It's a stand up is tough, man. Yeah, it's tough. You got to pay your dues, and you suck for a long time. You know, you suck. Long, for a long time, time meaning like half a decade. Yeah. Like years. Yeah, years. You know, and listen, there's there's a, there's people that have been really great from right from the beginning. Right. Um. Dave Chappelle was huge, you know, by the time he hit 20, it was huge. Uh, Ellen DeGeneres was on The Tonight Show within her first couple of years. Um, so there's people that just have the knack that are just, you know, good from the back. I'm not one of those people. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> not yet, man. No, no, no. So I've had to work hard, you know, I'm in my ninth year of doing it, but I've been grinding and doing mics and developing material. And, and uh, you know, the reality is for most of us, you know, you suck at the beginning. Yeah. You know, and then you get all your friends and your family to come out and buy tickets to go see these shows, and you're really terrible, and and uh, you know, and you just just power through them. But having a a, a bit of uh, na naivety and like yeah. denial about you know uh, being in denial about how good you are is a good thing because if I knew how bad I was, I would probably have quit. <laughs> you know, yeah. if I knew what people were saying about my stand up. When I wasn't around, you know, it's, uh, I probably would have quit. I mean, that's like anything else. Like with this podcast, this is like 500 and whatever I said, like going back to like the first 10, I, I can't yeah. go back and listen to those. Yeah. It will yeah, destroy yeah, yeah. my confidence. Yeah. I'm like, how did I even like make it this far? What, like, yeah. th th like 10 years from now, this is going to suck, right? Yeah. I'm going to look back at this and be like, this was awful. Yeah. At least I hope so, because yeah. that means I got better. Yeah. And you just keep growing and growing, you know, the, and you know, the issue, the issue with doing stand up is you have to grow in front of people in an yeah. audience and it's you're by yourself up there and you have a job to do your job is to make people laugh so when i get a new bit or a new thing that i want to try and i go up and i and i do the material uh it's usually not very funny i th i write what i think is funny uh but what happens you have to do it over and over and over again and so and then what happened and somebody taught me my friend aunt he actually lives in um uh well, anyway <laughs> and was a judge in the last case. I was thinking we're in Vegas. We're in, right. we're in, we're in Arizona. It was right over. Oh, wait, no. Like yeah, yeah, right. Here. He lives in Vegas. But he, uh, he, he was a judge on the last comic stand. He gave me a valuable lesson. He said, edit, 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 edit. Yeah. You know? And uh, so I'll give you an example. So when I first started, I'm in recovery. I'm sober uh, 15 years. Congrats. Off, off, yeah, thanks. Off crystal meth and all drugs and alcohol. But uh so I used to do a lot of stuff about drugs. And so I would say, you know, I ended up 118 pounds. I was missing teeth, living out of my car. I lost my career. And, uh, and I would tell this whole story how I uh, had a problem with drugs. None of it was funny. And so now, as I've evolved as a comedian, my opening for my drug material is uh, I recently quit smoking. Crystal meth. And that just says it all. And it's set up punchline. And so... Uh, what you want to do is you want to have more opportunities for people to laugh. So when you're a beginning comedian, it's usually set up, 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 punchline. 
set up, set up, set up, set up, set up, punchline. Uh, what you want it to be is set up, punchline, set up, set up, punchline, set up, punchline. So that's how you evolve as a comedian is, uh, you know, it's a craft. You learn the craft, but it's, uh, it's brutal. It's just brutal at the beginning. You remember like the first time you really bombed at a club? Yeah. You mind scooting up a little yeah. bit just because I don't have my video guys? So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. We have to be perfect. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I was looking at you look at the screen. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I did a show. I'll tell you about two, two bombs. I'll tell you, give you two bombs. Yes. Stars. So I, my, I, brought, I invited. I was in my first year or two, and I was doing uh, it's like a beginner show at the Comedy Store. And I invited my parents and my brother and like 14 friends were all there to see me. And so this show was horrible. Yeah. It was horrible. There's no comedians that deserved to be, to be on the iconic comedy store stage, and, uh, including myself. And so they were all horrible. And I get up, and when you're a new comedian, what happens is when you get nervous, you speed up. When you're a professional comedian, when you get nervous or something doesn't go right, you slow down. And so uh, I was nervous and it wasn't going well. And I was just like, it was like reading off, speed reading off a piece of paper. You know, I wasn't connected to what I was saying. I wasn't connected to the audience. And I just, blah, 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 you know, and just zip through it, right? And so Ant, for the judge on The Last Comic Standing, he was there watching me. And I get off the stage and it, I totally bombed. And, uh, I totally bombed, and I get off the stage. Ant took off. He always right. takes off after my set. So I go outside, and I text Ant. I'm like, I don't think that went so well. So Ant calls me, and he's like, and I'm like, oh, man, I don't think it went so well. And he goes, listen, I'm not going to lie to you. You bombed. And I'm like, oh, my God, my parents and my, my brother and my, all my friends are there. I'm like, what do I do? And he says, okay, this, this is what's going to happen. He said, they're all going to come out after the show. He goes, I want you to go up to them and just say, hey, listen, I had a tough night. And he goes, they're going to say things to you like, no, no, you were great. Or uh, tough audience. Or, right. And uh, he goes, they're lying to you. And I'm like, oh, oh man. <laughs> He's like, they're lying to you. And uh, they came out after the show. They came out to me. And, they're and I'm like, yeah, I had a tough set. And they're like, no, you were great. Tough audience. The, all the things right. he had said, I'm just like, oh, my God. Genius. And so uh, what happened after that is I had major, major anxiety before I performed. And so I remember I would like take a nap before my show and I'd wake up and I'd be like, oh, my God, I got to perform tonight. And I'm like, I was so it was it was horrible. And people would ask me, like, do you love stand up? And I'd be and I would think to myself, no, I, I, I hate it. Like it's 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 horrible. It's so much and so much anxiety that comes with it. And so but what happened there was just little bits of glimmer of, of uh, laughter mm -hmm. and just a little bit of, you know, something that just kept me coming back. And I just fought through it. And I just fought through bad set after bad set, you know, and I, you know, I'm very likable on stage. And that's one of my strong points. People want to root for me and they like me. So, you know, I have that ability. But my skills as an artist, as a comedian, weren't there yet. And so I just had to fight through it. And there is, you know, there's been little turning points in my in my career that, you know, I'm like, wow. And now, uh, I do very well. You know, uh, I, I make people laugh, and uh, and I hooked up with Daryl and then Jay, and I perform at all the biggest clubs, and it's just, uh, it's a dream come true. And I, you're a sports guy, right? Yeah. I'll give you an analogy. Did you play any sports at all? I tried so bad. I was never okay. any good, but I, I I did play. Okay. No, that's all right. Did you play baseball? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Playing is kind of a stretch. I was on the team. Okay, that's all right. But no, so you, no, you played. You were on the team. Of course, you played. You played growing up, right? Right. So, so here's what it's like for me. And I played uh, baseball through college and uh, at Sonoma State University. I was a very good baseball player, and it was my passion. It was my love. And so doing stand-up for me now, it's like the bottom of the ninth inning. You're down by, you know, three runs. You're in the batter's box. There's, there's one out. The guy's throwing 90 miles an hour. The guy before you strikes out. You're nervous. You're excited. And you're walking up to that plate. And you walk up to that plate. And, you, it, you know, you got to use that ner nervous energy for a positive yeah. result. And uh, you're, you're nervous. You have anxiety. But you're excited. And you walk into that plate. And, you, you know, you, you, take, you, swing, you swing the bat. You hit the ball. It goes in the gap, and you're running to first, and you're running around second, and then you try to stretch it into a triple, and you run, and you dive head first, and like, 
the dirt goes everywhere, you're safe, it's like bang, bang, and you're safe, and you score three runs to tie the game, and the whole crowd's going nuts, and you just look up and you're just like, oh, like, yes, that adrenaline, that feeling, you know, I get that same feeling that, that I got from playing baseball from doing stand-up. So do you, did you not even hear the audience that one night when your family was there, when you were up there? You're just in your head, yeah. you know, you're just, you know, you're, you're, it was like, you just black out, you just go through it, you know, and I'm sure I got laughs, uh, but you're, you know, it, it's, yeah, you just know sometimes when, when it does, I'll give you another bomb too, this one I knew for sure, it was my, this was my biggest bomb, I was doing a show uh, at the Comedy Store also, relatively new, my first few years, and uh, I do crowd play sometimes, and there was these two there was one of the things I would joke if there was two girls together, I'd say, I'd ask them, are you lesbians? And there's these two really hot girls, uh, lesbian girls, and they're like kissing, you know, yeah. on stage. And so I, I went up and I said, are you guys lesbians? And they said, uh, they said, yeah. And I said, and I, and I said, I don't know why I get so excited about lesbians. That means I have no chance of sleeping with you. Just as a joke, right? Nobody laughed, just died. Creep. Yeah, they get, nobody laughed. And then this girl in the front row raised her hand and she goes, No, honey, it's okay, I'm straight. And am I allowed to swear on this podcast? Yeah. Okay. And she goes, No, I'm straight. And she goes, And you got no chance of fucking me either. And I went and I froze. Right? And I and I and I didn't and I and I I just froze. And the whole crowd the crowd laughed. That was the only laugh the whole show. So what I did is I tried to go straight into my material and I didn't address it. And I didn't get a single laugh the whole set. Yeah. And I walked off, I think that's the only time that's ever happened. I walked off and I sat down and it was, it was brutal. It was my biggest bomb. And then after the show, the girl that heckled me came up to me and she's like, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. And she gave me a hug and she goes, I ruined your show, I am so sorry. And uh, I bombed so bad that the heckler gave me a hug and apologized <laughs> after the show. <laughs> That's how bad I bombed. Oh, my God. The only, the only joke that got a pop was hers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. But now I'm a, I'm a pro now. So I'd, I would have been like, oh, yeah, I got an eight ball of cocaine in my pocket that says you will. Or, you know, or, you well, know, you got to be able to adapt. Yeah. So what you do is you learn, you know, you just got to call out the elephant in the room. You know, if you're doing a set and the waitress drops a glass and it smashes all over the place, then you got you to gotta call it out. I shoot, I, do, I was doing a show in my hometown, I was doing in my home area at the San Jose Improv. It was a huge show, like two, two three hundred people. And uh, uh, this girl was really drunk that I, I grew up with. I, you know, I haven't seen her in 20 years, but she was really drunk and she was interrupting the show for the previous comedians before I, before I went on. And... Uh, the comedian right before me gets off and he's like, do you know that girl? And, uh, and I'm like, yeah, man. And she, he's like, she ruined my show. And he's like, and so I went up and the, the manager had come up to me before asking if I knew her. And I'm like, well, I know her. She's like, she says you're, she's your best friend. I'm like, no. And, and she goes, can we kick her out if she keeps being unruly? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So I go up on the stage and I'm doing my, and I told her, I, I called it out right after the beginning because she was, she was ruining everybody's set. And I said, I'm going to give you one more chance. This is your last chance. You do not interrupt the show. And I start doing my set, and she starts screaming out, interrupting the show. The police came and, esc and came and kicked her out during my show <laughs> and during my set. And so I'm like, I, we had to stop the show. And I'm like, I told you. And like, I just started yeah. talking about it. And then I started talking to the crowd about it. And they walked her out. And, uh, and I addressed it. And everybody started laughing. I made fun of it. And then I started, I had to go back. I was halfway through one of my bits. And so I, I'm like, okay, well, let's just... I'm just going to backtrack and we'll start here. And then, and then I started a little too early and I'm like, I already did that. And so everybody started laughing right. and then I fixed it. And then I did the jokes and I went on and I had one of my best sets ever. So you just got to be present. Yeah. You got to be focused. And you, you know, I mean, you just, you know, you, what you, it's like, it's like playing sports because, you know, like the, they talk about being in the zone, you know, and Joe, the best, you know, the best Joe Montana, you know, had a, an incredible ability to get to be in the zone. Tom Brady had, has an incredible ability to perform under pressure. When the, the chips are down and the game's on the line, you know, there's certain people that can that put themselves and just be, you know, unconscious and, and what they've done, you know, and, and it, you, you develop that skill by repetition and by um, working hard 
and doing it over and over and over again. And then some people just have that innate ability. So what you want to try to do with stand-up is you want to try to do the work and then you want to get out of your mind and you just throw it all away. You've done the work, you get on stage, you try not to plan anything. You know your set list, but you just try to be present in, in your body and just like an athlete. And then you let it all go. So that way if somebody drops a glass or the police come in and kick somebody out or the girl raises her hand and says, you know, uh, and heckles you or whatever, that you're, you can handle all the different situations. And a lot of times when these things happen, you, uh, it makes your show better because it makes, yeah. you, it makes you look like you're a professional. You know, so you want to stay away from reading, pe pe like, you know, sounding like you're reading off a, a piece of paper. And you want to be a student of the craft. But the best comedians, the craft is really to go and tell your bits that you've done a thousand times and make it sound like you're telling it for the first time. Mm. Cause you know what you're going to say, cause it's just going to be off the top of your head, but at the same time you're engaging with the audience. Cause again, like you're able to adapt to them when they throw something your way. If there's a heckler over here yeah. saying something, you're yeah. able to adapt and actually talk to the audience. And at the same time, tell the bits that you have memorized in your head over yeah. and over and over again. So it's coming off natural. Yeah, exactly. And then sometimes like th where things will happen and I'll, I'll write on stage, you know, something will happen. I'm like the, uh, something will happen and I'm like, Oh my God, I'm keeping that. Or I'll just make something up and try something different and, you know, with some of the bits. And then sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And so when it, you know, you try to do it a few times and if, if you come up with something you think is funny, a lot of times you might think it's funny. Other people don't think it's funny. And you try it a few times and then if they don't laugh, uh, you know, then you know it doesn't work. And then there's sometimes where something I didn't think was funny. I'll give you an example. I do a joke. And somewhere, just out of the blue, I just said, I, you know, it was a dating on Tinder joke, and I, and I texted her, hashtag me too. Oof. And it really didn't make any sense to the joke, but the crowd just died laughing. I'm like, that's weird, because it really doesn't make yeah. any sense. Um, and, uh, but now I kept it, you know, because everybody laughs. I'm like, okay, if you think it's funny, I'll keep it. And so, it's funny, like you have like these things drawn up in your head of what you think's gonna hit, yeah. and all of a sudden you're like, oh shit. Like yeah. the audience might have a totally different perspective because comedy yeah. is so subjective. You have no yeah. idea what's going to make people laugh. Yeah. And then you do it over and over again. So like, uh, last night I was doing, we were doing uh, uh, CB Live and I was doing a set and uh, I'm working on some new stuff about uh, dealing candy when I was a kid, being the candy dealer. And so what I'm trying to do is, anyway, I'm creating this new bit, but I've done it a few times at mics and stuff and smaller shows, but this big first big show I tried it. But uh, I missed punchlines. I didn't tell it great, but I mixed it. I put it in the middle. So I do jokes that work. I put it in the middle. And then I, do, I end with jokes that work. And so uh, it wasn't that great. Didn't, I got a few laughs here and there, but it has potential. But that's how I'm working, working it out, you know? Wow. At what age did you, because you said you're in your ninth year doing yeah. this? You, you yeah. played baseball, you said? Yeah, I played baseball through college, yeah. That is, um, where, where'd you play? Sonoma State. Oh, wow. So where'd you grow up? Uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So you've lived one hell of a life then. You've bounced around, uh, <laughs> done a few things. No, it's, it's good, man. It's, uh, yeah, you know, if, uh, I told you I, I've, I've been sober 15 years yeah. of drugs and alcohol. Um, you know, I worked at CBS. I worked in radio and uh, selling advertising and uh, had a great career doing that. And then I lost everything, man. I ended up 118 pounds, missing teeth, living on my, out of my car. And uh, I ended up in jail on a drug possession charge. I lost everything. And then uh, I got sober, man. And now... You know, I didn't get sober. My friend Jay Moore, who I, I toured with, he says, you know, he, uh, he always says, man, I didn't, he's sober too, but he talks about it on, on the media too, so I'm not outing him. But he says, uh, I didn't get sober to sit on the bench, you know, and it's like, I'm following my dreams. I'm going for it. So, you know, I've always had a day job and, and work, but up until the pandemic, I left my day job. I saved up some money and, you know, this is my career. And so uh, it seems to be working out fine, so. Amen, brother. What, what do you think was the tipping point for you? Like, was it going to jail? Was it just like you finally reached that breaking point of like, I, I'm ki literally killing myself doing this? Yeah, you know, it was, um, I mean, I was dying. I was 118 pounds, I was dying. And my teeth were fall falling out and stuff. And uh, I really didn't think I was gonna be able to get off meth. I really didn't, yeah. you know? And uh, I was just gonna ride it out. You know, it's like, it, it it's like I was on the Titanic, and the Titanic is sinking. And at some point, I just was res resided the fact that, you know, this is it. You know, I'm just going to, and I figure, you know what? I'm just going to have a few drinks, and I'm just going to keep ride it out until the end and, and die. And uh, I didn't think there was any chance of me getting clean, and I got arrested. And uh, they gave me the option of rehab or jail. 
and I chose rehab and I checked myself in on February 13th of 2007. And I'll be honest, I, you know, to be honest, I, I enjoyed smoking meth. It makes me feel so good. And, uh, but man, it just destroys you. It destroys your body and it, it's, it's, it's horrendous. And, uh, but uh, I went to this rehab and I just started taking direction and, and, and uh, I started telling them, I started doing what people told me to do. And if, next thing you know, I'm 15 years touring the country with the people I grew up watching on TV, you know? And, uh, but I always say, you know, I, I live a very spiritual life. I meditate twice a day. Mm -hmm. I live a very spiritual life. And I always, I made a promise. And the promise is that I use the gifts that I've been given to better serve other human beings. You know, so whether I achieve success as a comedian, I, I do a lot of recovery. I speak in jails all the time to inmates. Um, you know, I've done that over 300 times. And, uh, uh, you know, I just, my, I think getting a second chance in life came with a price. Mm -hmm. And the price is I can't live a selfish life anymore. And the obligation for me to stay sober and get clean, because not many people do. It's hard to get yeah. clean off meth, off all drugs and alcohol when people have an addiction problem. But I think the price that I have to pay now is that I have to live a life of service in order to keep it. And so uh, in all, all, all facets of my life are somehow related to, uh, to service. So uh, stand up, I make people laugh. I'm in recovery. I speak to the jails, to inmates, to help them find their own way into recovery. Um, I'm very, very active in my recovery program. Um, I, I started working at one point. I was working for some drug rehabs, doing admissions. I admitted, uh, meaning convinced, uh, almost a thousand people to go get help, and many of which are still alive, and many of which have died. Um, I've meditate. I've uh, resuscitated a, a heroin overdose. Uh, he flatlined for a few minutes, and I resuscitated him, and, or I did CPR on him until the paramedics came, and he lived. Um, I have a podcast. It's called Second Chances. Um, you can find it at secondchances.tv. And uh, where uh, I, the purpose of my podcast is to bring hope and inspiration to the world and, uh, and bring positive messages. And uh, so I've had on, you know, a lot of famous people. I've had on, you know, people with autism. I had uh, cancer survivors. Um, I've had uh, Carney Wilson from Wilson Phillips, you know, uh, just uh, Joe Manganiello was married to Sofia Vergara, mm -hmm. big actor. I've had a, a lot of different things, and my my goal with the podcast is to bring hope and inspiration to the world uh, through positive messages and people's incredible stories. I had a couple guys on that had near death experiences that died yeah. and came back, and and uh, so that's one facet. And then um, so that's my you know. But listen, I'm a human being, and you know, and sometimes I fall my I find myself becoming selfish and self-centered and worried about myself and stuff like that. But then I, what happens to me then is I start getting uh, unhappy when I start doing that. And then I got to switch back to being of service and helping other people. And what can I bring to the situation instead of what, what can I take out of it? So I tour with Daryl and I do a lot for him. I help him out. You know, I organize every, you know, I, I, I do a lot. When I, when I tour with Jay Moore, uh, I take notes of all his sets and help him come up with punchlines. And so, I try to figure out what can I do to help other people. And so, you know, I think there's a, a little secret uh, that a lot of people don't know is that the more that you do for others, the more you receive, you know? So it, it, maybe it is a little bit selfish because the more you give away, uh, the more you get back in return and you become happy. Well, I hope people are listening to that, that little nugget right there. I mean, that, that's life in a nutshell, right? Mm -hmm. We were talking about like making reels and stuff and having to do all that crap for social media these yeah. days that's definitely going to be one that i'm making for you right there i hope, I hope again so. like with your story and everything that you've gone through now living a life of service helping other people you're obviously a well-spoken individual yeah, thank like you. you have a ton of gifts that you're now shedding light on yeah, and helping others you. yeah that's my you know uh you know i just i made a vow you know i'm always going to use my gifts to better to better serve others you know it's when when people that want to get sober that you know need help i I have to. I have to help them. Uh, you know, when comedians that are coming up and that show the um, the desire and the work ethic to do the work, I'll point them in the right direction because somebody did that for me. You know, and uh, I just try to go through life being a good human being. And you know, I, I think I think what's happened as a result of my recovery, my drug addiction was not a bad thing. It was a gift. Mm -hmm. And it was a gift because it led me to um, 
It led me to spirituality. I'm not a religious person. I'm a very spiritual person. It led me to that. And it also has given me the tools to become the best version of myself and become the person that I was intended to be on this earth. But I'm always learning. I'm always growing. And, uh, you know, if I don't learn the lesson, if, if life is trying to teach me a lesson and I'm not listening and I'm lear learn learning it, uh, there's usually something happens that makes sure that I learn it, you know? So I try to be proactive and be a good person and do the right thing and make the right decisions because a lot of time you learn through pain. You learn through suffering. And, uh, you know, um, a lot of, you see a lot of big people that make it really famous yeah. and they become uh, not so nice people. Or, oh, you right. know, and then of what course. happens is something happens and they lose it all and they, their egos get crushed, you know? And, uh, and you can see it coming. You're like, wow, you can't go through life treating people like that because then people aren't going to root for you, you know? Of course. And then their ego gets crushed. So I try to surrender my ego constantly, you know? So uh, instead of, you know, because your ego grows itself. And, you know, and so I try to surrender and be humble and giving and kind. But when I start, you know, achieving success and I start believing the lies and stuff, then, you know, usually something happens that humbles me. It's like, you know, I did 17 shows in uh, 18 days. And I, I did Vegas. I did eight shows. I got my name on the billboards on all the, uh, it was crazy. It was insane. And then, you know, and then I'm thinking, wow, my career is taking off. This is amazing. And all these people are, you know, congratulating me. And I got a call from some uh, a manager and stuff. And it was just, and I'm like, this is great. And then I come home and, you know, and then like all of a sudden for like two weeks, I had like two shows. And it's like, wow, okay, you know what? This is, it's constantly ups and downs. That's life. And so I try not to get too high on the highs and too low on the lows. And, uh, and now things are picking up again. And, you know, and just, you know, we're all human beings. You know, I'm no better than anybody else. And, you know, I, I heard something that was really interesting. We've always been judged in growing up by our, uh, our intelligence, by our book smarts, right? And how good we are in school and our grade point average. And, you know, we, and so that has been a sign of intelligence. But you know what? People are geniuses in other ways. You know, some people might not be book smart or that type of smart or figure out two trains are going opposite directions and you know, whatever. And pe people might not be able to figure that stuff out, but they also might be a genius in music or art or philanthropy, or we all have our gifts. You know, we all have our gifts and, and the things that we're special at, uh, the, you know, and, uh, how can we find those out and how can we judge people, uh, for their gifts, you know, instead of what society has deemed is what's relevant. Well, I mean, how many people have you? I'm trying to think, like off the top of my head, Derek Jeter, another athlete right there. Yeah. Didn't finish college. You yeah. Know? Like, yeah. Maybe that's because he was a great baseball player. I'm trying to think. Dave Grohl, Foo Fighters, yeah. dropped out of high school. Yeah. Was not a good student at all. Genius. Genius songwriter. Yeah. Genius filmmaker. Genius, basically in everything that he does that he yeah. wants to do yeah. because he's passionate about it, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, there's so many people out there that can inspire millions around the world that did not have like businessmen. There's so many businessmen out there yeah. that high school dropouts, like I have no book smarts, but like yeah. at the end of the day, like you don't even need to learn half that stuff. Yeah. But you're not supposed to say that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you know, so listen, I, I got a college education. It was great. I don't use any of it now, but it taught me how to work ethic and how to study and how to get projects done on time. There's a lot of valuable lessons in that. Uh, but people could learn those lessons otherwise and maybe school isn't cut out for everybody yeah. And maybe it is cut out for a lot of people, you know, there's nothing wrong with that with going to college um, But I think celebrating for people for their own uh, Individual talents and, and achievements and, and you know, you know, I, I got I had this um, I had a, an autistic guy on my podcast and the guy was brilliant, mm -hmm. you know, he, he, now he's not I think he was on the spectrum uh, right. a little bit, and I, you know, social. I think they have issues with social cues. Yes, yeah. You know, and so he wasn't good in that area, but he goes and he does public speaking, and he was very, you know. So he has his gifts, and uh, you know, I have drug addiction. That was my, that was the um, the big obstacle that I've had to overcome, and now that's turned into a gift because it's given me a bit the ability to help other human beings that come behind me that that might not know how to get sober. You know, and uh, I'll tell you a story. I went to, uh, I speak in prisons and jails in LA County, and I've been in there almost 300 times. I met this kid in there, and he, uh, he came out and he says, hey, I'm getting out on Friday. And he says, what do I do? And I said, well, 
why don't you come find me at this recovery meeting and I'll help you get started. And so he came and uh, he didn't, he never showed up at the meeting. He got out, he never showed up. I saw him like, I don't know, six months later and he came, and he sees me and he comes running after me and, and he runs up and he's like, hey, do you remember me? And I'm like, no. And, uh, and he's like, from jail. And I'm like, oh, dude, what's up? I can, I can remember you. And he's like, hey, man, he goes, I came looking for you, but you weren't here. He goes, I got out, I started drinking again. Mm. I hit another bottom, I came here looking for you, you weren't here, but I raised my hand. He said, all these people surrounded me, they got me into a sober living. He's like, he goes, I'm sober three months. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. And uh, I was at a, about a year after that, I was at a recovery meeting, he was a speaker. And he started sharing his story. And he said, uh, he goes, he was introduced to recovery uh, by this guy that came into jail and told him something that saved his life. And he looked at me and he smiled. And so, and now I realized that, you know, at a moment of clarity, spiritual awakening, I'm like, wow, my recovery isn't just about me or my job or my career, get my life back. My career, my, my recovery is about being of service to other human beings. You know, he, this guy's still sober. I think it's, I think he's clean sober eight years now or something like that. And, uh, and he's, a, he's a producer on, for reality TV and he's got his life back and we stayed in contact, but you know, it's like, it's incredible. You know, it's the, the gifts that uh, are available. And I, and I think where I'm at now in life, you know, and I mentioned I'm a spiritual person, is I'm looking for those, those coincidences. You know, those things, you know, the, it's serendipity. You know, like when you're, you're going somewhere and you r randomly meet a friend that, that and it, it's just like destiny that you oh, guys yeah. met, you know, it's a serendipity. These weird miracle things. Sometimes I'm like, I swear to God, we're living in the matrix. Right. You know, it's like, how can this happen? How can all these coincidences happen? And if, like, if I go through my life and I look at all the little coincidences happen in my life and I put them all on paper and I add them up and I'm like, it, there's physically, it's physically impossible for there the not to be something, some order or some, you know, we all have different beliefs and uh, there's, it's just impossible for there not to be some reason, some purpose that we're here on this, pla on this planet and some lessons that we need to learn. And, you know, and, uh, and so where I'm at now is I'm trying to become more conscious and to see those lessons and see those coincidences and, and those miracles. And uh, so I can evolve as a human being and become the best version of myself on earth. And, you know, and, uh, but life's tough, man. I lost my brother a couple years ago, he mm -hmm. died. And uh, life has challenges. It's not always, you know, happiness and joy yeah. and pleasure. You know, that's just not it. You know, we, you know, I lost my brother. It was, it was grief and, you know, and, and loss. And we have hardships. We lose jobs. We lose friends. We, you know, death is, you know, pre is prevalent in all of our lives. It's something we all have to face. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of ups and downs. And, you know, I was always under the impression, this is my philosophy growing up, was that life was about pleasure. And so I sought pleasure through uh, drugs and alcohol and uh, parties and fun. Mm -hmm. And I always thought the more pleasure I could get, the more happiness I can get. And, uh, but that's not true. Right. You know, I think now that life is about a lot of things. But one of the main things that I've learned now is, is life is about service and giving and serenity and feeling good about yourself and building your self-esteem and bringing value to other people. And, and uh, becoming the best version of yourself. And so I'm trying to grow my abilities to be more conscious so I can see what my gifts are so I can use those gifts to better serve others. And you do believe in like, like you said, you're spiritual and not necessarily religious, right? But like you believe that everything happens for a reason. Like you said, there's those serendipity moments where it's just yeah. like, how the hell did this happen? Like yeah. even like with your brother's tragedy, like yeah. you don't know why that part of the story was written. Yeah. Maybe not yet. Maybe yeah. you do know, but yeah. like you're going to know by the time it's all said and done, like why this all happened for yeah. a reason. I, you know, nobody knows, nobody knows, but I think, you know, I don't believe in, uh, uh, you know, an old white haired dude judging me for heaven or hell where yeah, I go to, right. you know, if, you know, but I believe that I'm put on this earth to be, to learn and to grow and to evolve. And, um, and I just think there's something that, that happens after. I don't know what it is, but I know there's purpose and value on this earth. If there was no reason for us to be here and we just died and we just came, you know, it turned into nothing, then that means that, that my cousin died of ovarian cancer as a kid, growing up, growing up as a young woman, and she died of ovarian, of ovarian cancer for nothing. Or the children that, you know, there's gotta be something, there's a reason. And so 
I think I have a better idea now uh, of why I'm here on, on Earth and you know my purpose on, li on, on Earth. Uh, I think the Dalai Lama has a, probably a better vision of what life mm -hmm. is all about right. or whatever. Of but, course. Um, you know, but the, the, I mean, the shorter answer is I don't know. You know, nobody knows. We'll no. find out when we, when, when we make that transition. Right. But I know there's something, you know. I think, yeah, I'm a firm believer that everything happens for a reason. Yeah. Who knows what it is? You, yeah. you can't prove yeah. anything. Yeah. You know, some people have their beliefs. Some people have certain doubts about it. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. How did we go from comedy to talking about <laughs> I know, <laughs> to talking right? about the point? But this is the yeah. stuff I love talking about. Yeah, me too. I didn't know you were going to go. Like, there's so many things that I'm like, all right, I got two hours to prep because Adam Black put this together for yeah, us. Yeah, like, yeah. literally at the last second, I'm like, oh, wow, there's so much I didn't know about yeah. Greg that he's just kind of unloading. Yeah. yeah. This is all, like right before we came on, um, we were talking about how one of your buddies was the main writers and producers for uh, Winning Time. Yeah. The new uh, Adam McKay documentary. Yeah, I did a little documentary show. Yeah, I did a uh, yeah Adam McKay. Uh, I did a little uh, research on you as well. I watched uh, some clips, and uh, he the uh, I watched the, the clip with uh, Magic, and he um, uh, my friend Jim Hecht is one of the writers and producers, and uh, his story is, is miraculous too. He had a vision board, and he actually wrote down. Uh, I'm telling Jim's story now, but <laughs> he wrote down on this cardboard. He was going out that he's a huge Lakers fan. Yeah. And he had this cardboard and he wrote down the date, like, you know, I'm paraphrasing his story, but it was the date that the show was going to air, right. the, the date and the year that it was going to air. And he went and he, he went and met with the writer of the book and like brought him some things and ended up having an Easter dinner with the book. And he just, just, he knew he was just going to just kept going and going. And he had this vision board on that card. So when he went out and pitched HBO or whatever, he brought that cardboard piece in. they launched the show, the date that he had written years prior on that cardboard. The date and the year. Isn't that incredible? Wow. Talk yeah. about serendipity, man. Yeah. I'm Holy telling you. Holy shit. We're in the goddamn matrix or Holy something. Holy shit. You know? But, and then, you know, here, there's another thing is that I've heard, I've heard people say this, that we can accomplish anything within our reach. I'm not going to be the offensive lineman for the Dallas Cowboys or right. nothing, but, you know, well, we can accomplish great things in, in life if we believe it, you know, and we work towards it. And so I'm at the point now, it's like, you know, so I don't have kids and I'm, uh, uh, and I've decided this, I always wanted kids my whole life and I'm not having kids. So I don't, but I'm at this point, I don't want, cause I don't want to spend the last, you know, 20, 30 years of my life, you know, raising kids. And I think there's something bigger and, you know, anyway, uh, I missed that opportunity. And that was one of my things that I always wanted to do. And now I got to a point where I'm old enough. I'm old. I'm too old where, you know, I don't want to be 70 years old playing catch with my kids. So. Uh, I'm not that old, but anyway, so I came to terms with it, but I don't have to leave a nest egg. I don't have to put my kids through college. I don't have to uh, worry about leaving anything behind, you know, for people that come behind me at this point right now. So why not follow my dreams? You know, if I got this one chance in life, why not follow my dreams? Why not do what I would do? My dream is to f do what I would do for free and make money and, and have a career doing it. And that's stand up for me. You know, making people laugh because I get to go out and I bring I get to bring happiness and joy and let people escape their problems or, uh, you know, and, and and just have some fun for a little bit. And I get to bring that to people. You know what a gift that is for me, you know, and again, it's 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 service, you know, to go out and make people laugh and bring happiness and and uh, enjoy to people's lives, you know. And so that's my dream. I'm, uh, you know, there's no reason why I can't accomplish that. And I have to, and I, I'm getting to the point because I've always had self-doubt or you can't do this or, you know what happens for me? Like what happened? Well, I'm not going to be able to accomplish that. So why should I try? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to fail, you know, so I'm not going to try. But in this one area of my recovery and in my standup, um, I'm, I'm working on breaking those barriers down and, and instilling that belief in myself that I can accomplish it. And I heard someone say, you can accomplish, you know, whatever you put your mind to if you believe it, you know? And I'm like, I don't know if that's, or tr that's true or not, but if I subscribe to that philosophy, then I'm probably gonna have a better chance. So that, I'm just going for it, man. I'm just going for it, you know? I left my career. I mean, not my career. I left my day jobs. I saved up some money. I have no idea how that's gonna work out. I have no idea, but I'm starting to, since I, and Daryl Ham told me, uh, the door behind you doesn't close fully. Or no, the, I'm sorry, the door in front of you doesn't open until you t close the door behind you completely. 
And so uh, I don't care, man. You know, it's like I will live in a small apartment or uh, not be able to go out to fancy restaurants for a long time or whatever. I'll, I don't care. I don't care about the material things. I want to live a life that, I'm, that makes me happy. You know, and uh, here, another thing, Jim Carrey, and I'm going to paraphrase what Jim Carrey said. So Jim Carrey was an accountant. You can Google, you can yeah, Google this story. Right. He was an accountant, and his dad got fired in his 50s, and he hated his job, hated it. And he says, if, if, if my dad can go through life and work at a job and get fired in his 50s at a job he hates, then why can't I take the chance and fail at something that I love, you know? So... You never know. Joy, you you get to provide joy, inspiration. And like you talk about, like never having the opportunity to have kids. Like you have an opportunity to mentor maybe some young comedians. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I do, yeah, I do, I do a lot of great things. And, uh, uh, you know, I've had a couple close calls with kids that that didn't work out. Um, But maybe just that's what wasn't in the cards for me, you know. And I, I think, I think we were all put on this earth to be of service. This is my philosophy. We're all put on this earth to be of service. Some people raise families. Some people own businesses, employ people so they can have health insurance and raise their families. Some people are social workers. Some people are volunteer, whatever, whatever capacity. I think we're put on this earth to be of service. And, uh, and I found mine. You know, my primary purpose in life is to be of service to other human beings. You know, that's my primary purpose. And, you know, my real primary purpose is to stay sober and help another alcoholic or drug addict achieve sobriety. That's my primary purpose. That's number one. Without that, none of it else happens. But I need to be of service in all areas of my life. You know, I need to help people in all areas, you know, and uh, uh, that's what I try to do, man. I just try to be of service and help, help others, you know, and be a good human being. Do you ever implement any type of these stories into your stand up? Because I feel like as great as it is to be funny, yeah. Like there's a lot of great communities out there that just like tell stories and like yeah. if you're like the goal is to get laughs. Yeah. But if you I feel like if you can get claps too just based on something yeah. that inspires someone that that sends goosebumps yeah. down their spine too. I do a ton of public speaking uh, about recovery to people that have uh, drug and alcohol addiction problems and I'm uh I'm a very good motivational speaker, very good. Uh and then the stand up I do uh, I did a motivational sp- uh, I did, I gave a talk about drugs and alcohol one time and I I just killed it, and, and I integrated. It's easier for me to integrate right now my stand-up into my uh, motivational drug, drug addiction speeches, yeah. talks. That's easier for me. But I'm trying to like, figure out when I do, I'm working, on my, I'm gonna, working on all the material to do my first hour special, is maybe somehow integrating some of that, like, just like you said, some of that positive messaging into that. But again, your, your job as a stand-up comedian is to make, make people laugh, right. not make people cry. So I'm trying to find what balance. that balance is. Uh, you know, how can I integrate those positive messages into the stand-up and be as good as a public speaker about recovery is, and, and, and be that good as a stand-up? So it's the process. That's what I'm trying to learn. You know, and uh, uh, I do talk about. I, you know, one of my stories. I, I talk about. Um, you know, my opening lines. I recently quit smoking crystal meth, and uh, and then I talk about. You know, getting off meth, and then. I'll tell you one story. I, this is a true story. So I was, I'm friends with Joe Manganiello, who's, right. uh, he was in True Blood, Magic Mike, um, and uh, he's married to Sofia Vergara. Right. Just and dream he, couple, right? Yeah, yeah. And so it's ridiculous. They're the best looking people on the planet. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, uh, Joe, I'm friends with Joe. He calls me up and he's like, he, and, uh, he says, hey man, he goes, I'm shooting this movie. And he goes, I'm shooting a scene where I do meth. And he's, and he's like, I, I've never done it before. Right. He's like, hey, will you come work with me on set and come uh, help me bring truth to doing meth? Because I don't know anything about it, right? So I go on the movie. It's called Arch Enemy. It's out now. You can watch it on, uh, download it on uh, all the sites or whatever. And uh, so he plays a uh, superhero that he does, he drinks and does drugs. And he's like the superhero supposedly from another planet. But he doesn't have his superhero powers on Earth. So you don't know if he's telling the truth or lying. So anyway, the scene is he snorts this meth and he kills all these drug dealers. Mm. So I, he brings me outside, stands me next to the director, and, and uh, he snorts the meth. He shoots the scene. Director yells, "Cut!" 
he comes straight over to me and Joe, Joe, I'm standing next to the director. He comes to me and he says, how was that? And the director's probably like, what the hell is, who's he talking to? Right. And, then, and I'm like, that was great. You know? And then I did a whole joke around it. Like the, the, the director is like, who are you, man? Right. And I'm like, I'm the meth consultant. You know? <laughs> and so anyway, the, the true story is uh, he was coming to me. He ended up shooting the scene. It just killed it. It was amazing. And then I ended up going to the movie premiere with him. We were still on a mini lockdown of COVID. And uh, I went to the movie premiere with him. And uh, I ended up sitting shotgun with Joe Manganiello, eating pizza in his SUV, watching him on the big screen, snorting meth that I coached him how to do. And, uh, and so the next night, he went on the Conan O'Brien show, and he told the story how he had to hire a meth coach to work with him, our arch enemy, which, which was me. And so that was a true story. And so I developed that true story into jokes yeah. and uh, into now I, I exaggerate it and I had punchlines and now I made it into this whole bit. And uh, so that's kind of integrating my personal story into that. But I haven't been able to crack that code of being super inspirational and positive messages yet be hilariously funny. But that, I think that's probably the direction I need to go for my last stand up is, you know, I'll, I'll tell you this. Uh, I did a show in the, in the Bay Area. I did um, I did the punchline uh, with Jay Moore. And uh, actually, no, I, I headlined the San Jose Improv. And I had like 200-something people uh, that came out, all my friends and family and high school people I graduated high school with. And I closed that show. And I said, at the end of the show, I said, you know, uh, I said, I'm so thankful for, that, uh, for all of my friends and family that came out in the show. And I look around, I see people I've known my whole life. And it's amazing because I was 118 pounds dying. I was, I was nearly dying, you know, dead from drug addiction. And I said, I look around and all the people that would have been at my funeral are here at my comedy show. Yep. You know, and I got to witness it, you know. And so that was, that was pretty inspirational, I think. But uh, Holy shit, dude. But, you know, and it's like my parents watched their kid lose everything and die, was dying. And uh, I did a show at the Punchline. I headlined a show like in 2017. I wasn't a great comedian yet, and uh, but uh, I headlined this show. And I look to my right, and I got a standing ovation. And uh, because I infused some of that positive message, and I got a standing ovation. And I looked at my parents, and they were so proud. You know, incredible, incredible. That's a full circle moment for you, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, they're very happy for me. I get, I, I get very emotional when I tell these stories. Yeah. But uh, you know what? It's like I'm an emotional person, man. You know, I just am. And uh, I don't have drugs and alcohol to hide from anything. I have to walk through these emotions. And, and, you know, these are, you know, this is joy. This is pure joy. Isn't that a great feeling, though? Yeah. To kind of, like, acknowledge those emotions as opposed yeah. to, like, hiding from them? Yeah, exactly. Man. You know? I think a true man experiences these emotions Absolutely. and feels it. And, you know, I don't have to hide it. You know, I'm a... Uh, you know, I think it's a little overkill when I cry during Ratatouille or, right, <laughs> or okay, commercial yeah, or whatever, absolutely. which I do because I'm it very, happens. yeah, yeah. But, uh, but I'm just, I'm just so damn grateful, man. I'm so grateful to get a second chance in life. Well, it's going to be interesting to see how you like find a way and navigate this into yeah. some of your bits. Cause it's yeah. like comedy is subjective. You can go any which route possible right. and it's going to be different. It's, it's going right. to hit different than some of the guys you're probably touring with, whether yeah. like Daryl's talking about this, like this yeah. is going to be serious stuff. Yeah. But it, I feel like once you get the rhythm of it and you get it down, it's going to be something completely different that nobody's ever heard before. Yeah, I think so. Yep. I don't, and you know, it's funny because I don't see a lot of people doing a lot of math jokes. You know, and yeah. uh, that's not a, it's always been like a tab taboo subject, right. you know, because it has a very bad reputation as it's as it should. It's a horrible, horrendous drug. But when I when people think of meth, meth users, they think of, uh, you know, low lives and criminals and uh, bad people that are doing this. And, you know, why wouldn't you just stop? But you know what the truth is? I was a good person. I was a good person. I was never. Uh, mean or hard you know i grew up i i think I, I was a good person and uh i you know i've made some mistakes of course like all of us have but uh you know i've never killed it you know anyway i but i was a and i've heard the saying before i wasn't a bad person that needed to learn how to become a good person mm -hmm. i was a s sick person that le n needed to learn how to become well and uh you know it's uh it's just miraculous 
it's just miraculous that, I, and you know, I need to stay in gratitude, you know, and you know, what if, you know, this is getting way over the top, but you know, what if we have this, you know, this chance of life and we, what if wherever we go next, we can't swim or eat watermelon or uh, fall down and scrape our knee or yeah. whatever. I mean, and all these experiences that we get here, what if, what if we don't get those where, the, wherever we go again? And what if we're like, you know, what if in the next dimension or next life or whatever, where we look back and we're like, man, I, I would give anything to, you know, uh, fall off my bike or stub yeah. my toe or whatever. And so I try, you know, to, to enjoy the gifts, you know, and, uh, and stay out of the future and stay present and enjoy the process. Like, I'm super, super present right now with you and telling these stories, you know? And, uh, and so I just try, but my problem is I, I worry about the future and how am I gonna pay my bills doing, you know, what if stand up doesn't work and what if I have to get a job? And I create all these false stories in my head that never come to true. And so, you know, my goal is to try to stay more present and focused so I can enjoy uh, where I'm at today. Because I'll tell you this, you know, I, like three years ago, if you told me I'd be touring with Daryl Hammond and Jay Moore, you know, I'd be like, oh my God, that, would, that was my goal. My dream is to hook up with somebody that's huge, you know, the incredible comedian and yeah. get to tour the country. That was my dream and my goal at that point. Now I've achieved that goal and it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that much. It's not, and it's like, I, you know, how am I going to become a headliner? How am I going to, you know, uh, have my hour special? How am I going to get a TV show? And it's like, there's never enough of anything to solve, to fill the void. There's never enough of anything to fill the void. And so how can I learn how to be happy and enjoy the process and enjoy the journey and, and, and enjoy going out and doing an open mic and trying new material and bombing, you know, or, um, you know, uh, getting a small part in, in a TV. I just did a, a small part in a movie. How can I just really embrace that and enjoy it and just know, you know, and, and it all works out, mm -hmm. you know, it all works out in the end, you know, uh, at least for my life, you know, I haven't had to try to manipulate or hustle or try to figure things out. I, you know how, I'll tell you how, you know how I became a, uh, a stand-up comedian, I'll tell you. I was at a recovery meeting and there was a kid that was had, the, a man who had, he was like 30 or something. He had like um, 30 days clean off cocaine. And uh, somebody introduced me to him and said, hey, do you want to give this guy a ride home? Will you give this guy a ride home? And I thought to myself on the inside, I thought like, why don't you give him a ride home? Why are you asking yeah. me? You know, but I've learned to say yes to life. Right. And I said, sure, I'll give this guy a ride home. So I, I, um, uh, I give him a ride home. I don't know anything about him. And, and I start taking him to recovery meetings. And uh, I would go get coffee before the meetings, and he would never order anything. And I asked him, I said, uh, are you broke? And he's like, yeah. He's like, yeah, I'm broke. And I'm like, do you have groceries? In, or, uh, do you have groceries? Or he had no car. He, his car's broken down. He had no, and I'm like, do you have groceries? And he's like, no. So... I'm like, all right, I'll take you grocery shopping. I'm like, where do you shop at? This dude took me to Whole Foods. You know, do you know, do you have Whole Foods yep. out here? It's yeah. like, he got like this little basket for like a hundred bucks, but I took him grocery shopping and I just did my part and uh, we became good friends. It turns out he was a stand-up comedian. I had never done stand-up comedian comedy before. I was an actor and I, but I never, never in a million years thought I'd be a comedian because I didn't think I was creative or funny or, you right. know. And so he invited me to go to this beginner show at the comedy store and I went and saw it and like half the comedians were terrible. And I had done spe so much public speaking mm -hmm. at, in the jails, and I tell these drug stories that made people laugh. And I, after the show, I told them, I'm like, I could do drug stories, tell some drug stories, and be as funny as half of those guys making a joke. And he's like, you want to try it? And I'm like, uh, okay. Why not? Yeah. yeah, so I, I'm, again, I'm, I say yes to life. So he put me up at this beginner show uh, like a week later, and I told some drug stories, and then I wrapped it up with a recovery message. And... Uh, the guy, the host comes up after me and I got like high fives coming down. It was probably really terrible, but it was more about getting sober than it was about making people laugh. But it, people were high fiving me and the host comes back up and he's like, he's like, holy shit, I didn't know this was an AA meeting. And uh, it, everybody laughed and stuff. And that was the first time I did stand up. And so flash forward years later, I'm, at, I'm uh, doing a show. I'm at the most famous comedy club on the st stage at the comedy store in the main room. I'm behind the curtain, about to walk through the same curtain that Richard Pryor, Jay Leno, David Letterman, Dave Chappelle, all the greatest comedians in history, Eddie Murphy, they've all walked out through this curtain. 
and I'm hosting the show, and I'm talking to Bill Burr. And I'm about to walk on that stage and take the mic, and I'm going to introduce Bill Burr, one of the biggest comedians out there right now. And I thought to myself, how did this happen? How did this happen? I was 118 pounds, missing teeth, living out of my car. How did I get on the most famous stage in the world about to introduce one of the biggest comedians in the country? How did this happen? You know what happened? I helped a newcomer. I was of service. I gave somebody a ride home. You know? What if I was selfish and self self centered that day? What if I said no? My whole life changed from being a service to another human being. My whole life changed. Wow. And see you getting choked up talking about yeah, this stuff, yeah. man. This is I'm a stand up comedian, I toured the country <laughs> because I helped a newcomer. Yeah. You know? Wow. Holy shit. And uh, again, I just, I got to stay in that mentality. I got to stay in the mentality of what can I bring to people? How can I be of service? You know, instead of what can I get out of everything, you know? Uh, and if I just, if I go through life with that mentality, everything else is going to work out. Well, let's end on that note then, because the, this entire episode, didn't know where this was going to go. Easily one of the most inspirational interviews I think I've ever done. Thank just you. the stories that you told, man. Yeah. Unbelievable stuff. Thank you. That I wouldn't have known about you just looking you up either. Yeah. Thank you so much, man. I, it's been an honor, honor to be on your podcast. So, uh, if you want to follow me, you can find me at uh, Real Greg Baldwin on Instagram. Uh, uh, Real Greg Baldwin, if you want to listen to my podcast, it's secondchances.tv. Uh, you can see my website, it's at uh, realgregbaldwin.com. Well, we're definitely doing this again, whether it be I like over so. Zoom, over the phone. I got yep. so much more that I want to talk to you about. But this was episode 516 with Greg Baldwin. Again, check him out tonight with Daryl Hammond. Uh, CB Live tonight and tomorrow. Yep. Tonight and tomorrow, 7 p.m. Remember, we're presented by Mayweather Boxing and Fitness and now TickPick. And again, if you haven't used TickPick, ladies and gentlemen, if you're looking for tickets, listen up because there's no hidden fees. It's unbelievable. You can actually get Phoenix Suns tickets, Arizona Diamondbacks, back east where Tick Pick is, New York Yankees baseball. Tickets going for as low as $20, and there's no hidden fees. Uh, but this was episode 516 of the podcast. Hit the light, Zach.